Hey guys, this is your High Fist here with another juicy video. As always, thank you to Steven Erickson for commenting on and sharing the last video that I made. Will I ever be able to say that again, guys? Will this channel ever see those golden words Erickson here ever again? Only time will tell. Before I say stuff uh, I shouldn't, let me just pull up my notes and get the video started. Uh, I need to learn to shut up sometimes. So, demons. By far the most underrated race in the 10 big books. I know I said the same thing about the Fokrul Asail in my Fokrul Asail video. I know I said the same thing about the Tila Naimas in my Tila Naimas video, but this time, guys, I'm serious. Demons are by far the most underrated race, group of races, however you want to describe them, in the 10 big books. And in their portrayal, there is a subtle but powerful anti-racist message that we will explore in this video. So let me explain. The demons of the Malazan books in many ways are a parallel of sorts for oppressed races, namely races that uh, have been subjected to colonization, to slavery, and even races that face invisible prejudices to this day. There are so many strands that Erickson places so carefully, each one of which has a message. So the focus of this video will be on unpacking those strands, if that makes sense. Because while there are many other aspects of the books that also look very deeply into the question of uh, racism and slavery and subjugation and things like that, it's very distinct and unique here. The first noticeable thing about them is the way in which Erickson immediately gives us a contrast. In the very first book, in the very first battle, look at how they are portrayed. They are a savage, unstoppable, monstrous horde. They are so inhuman and incapable of reason that they destroy their own allies. Even Anamander Rake has to stop focusing on whatever it is that he's doing to just wipe these guys out. That's how much trouble they are. And yet, a few hundred pages later, we get Pearl, the demon Pearl, who is such a tragic character and a total contrast to the idea of demons that the book has imprinted into our minds so far. It's a shocking and jarring uh, revelation to see Pearl reluctantly making that sacrifice to save Quick Ben and the sort of the poignancy in those words, right? And this is all despite Pearl having the power to destroy an entire city. So in a single page, what initially seems to be this savage race of twisted monsters is instantly humanized. And Erickson shows us that there's a lot more under the surface, which is so true of all savage hordes, if you think about it, right? Uh, they might look like bloodthirsty monsters from a battlefield perspective, but when you narrow it down to each individual, each of them are just as human as the supposedly civilized soldiers standing in front of them. I particularly enjoyed how this transition is so clean because if Erickson had just humanized the first demon we see, if the first demon we see was just treated sympathetically, it wouldn't have had the same impact. It wouldn't have made the same point. No, in typical Erickson style, he lets us fall into our own racist assumptions about them at first and then he corrects us. He, he lets us kind of assume that these are typical destructive uh, demons and then he says, aha, I, I caught you red-handed, you racist. Look at Pearl and, and check your presumptions, right? I love that. I love that. So that, that instead of introducing it straight away, he kind of sets that pit for us. And once we've fallen into that pit, uh, Erickson kind of gloats. Uh, that's the kind of stuff which re uh, really drive any point home. He makes another interesting choice as a writer, this time from a world-building standpoint. The portrayal of demons in the 10 big books, in my opinion, is far more reminiscent of how demons are portrayed in non-Western mythology, particularly East Asian and South Asian mythology. And what I mean by that is that in most Western, especially Judeo-Christian depiction of demons, there is an inherent element of evil or malice or destruction 
that's associated with them. If you look at the New Testament, for instance, essentially all mentions of demons are in the context of Jesus exorcising demons that have possessed people. The term devil itself, which was made famous by the King James Bible, is itself derived from the word demon, if I'm not mistaken. A fictional and more fun example of this kind of Western conceptualization of demons would be something as basic but widespread as Dungeons and Dragons, where the mythology typically depicts demons as these sort of uh, engines of destruction. In the Eastern traditions, particularly in Hinduism and Buddhism, demons are simply another race who live in another dimension, much like demons in the Malazan world. They are not inherently more evil or good than the rest of us. They're just different and look monstrous and are from another sort of realm. The Asuras, the Rakshasas, they have their own kingdoms, their own cultures, their own history, etc. They are not the antagonists by default in Hindu and Buddhist mythology simply because they are demons. So by using this approach as their foundation for the depiction of uh, demons, both Erickson and Ian Esselmott, to be fair, to give credit where credit is due, they are both able to give demons this amazing depth where they can in one page make demons look like savage beasts and in the, in the next make them look like one of us. So let's look at what Erickson does as a storyteller to take this to the next level in the 10 big books. As I said, there are parallels here with both slavery and colonialism. The slavery image, I think, is the easier of the two to visualize, right? I mean, think about it. They were captured from their native land, usually Aral Gamelin or the Shadow Warren, and they are then dragged to another world as prisoners to serve a master who sees them as nothing but property. That is the quintessential journey of a slave across all cultures that have practiced slavery. One of the most powerful quotes about this comes from Midnight Tides, from Udinas, and I'm quoting him here. Uh, he has this conversation with himself over what exactly a demon is, right? And this is his quote about what a demon is. Some creature torn from its own realm, bound like a slave by a new master who cared nothing for its life, its well-being, who would simply use it like any other tool, until made useless, whereupon it would be discarded. Here we have the parallel explicitly put in words. And what makes it powerful is that these observations are made by Udinas, who is a slave himself. The people we see dealing with demons until this point in the series were powerful characters. Quick Ben, Anamanda Rake, Baukalain, Tattersail. These are all people in positions of power. And they therefore have no moral issues that they grapple with when they see demons. Someone like Baukalain just sees them as a tool, much like an old-fashioned slave master would. Someone like Anamanda Rake just sees them as a nuisance to be destroyed. Even someone as educated as Tattersale just sees them as single-minded monsters. But a slave knows another slave when he sees one. And Udinas was the perfect choice to make that statement and really solidify that slavery image. Probably the best example of this is another character, in Midnight Tides, Lilac, the demon whom Trull saves. He finds her injured and the demon is like, will I ever see my mate and children again? Will I ever see my home again? And she's not even a soldier. That's what makes it even sadder. She was just a caster of nets, aka a fisherman in her native lands in Adel Gamelin. She's not trained to fight or anything. But to the Edor, that doesn't matter. A demon is a demon and therefore has to be used as a foot soldier on the front lines. And there's, there's a heartbreaking scene where Troll tries to get someone to heal her, and the Edur healers just say, look, you can always just get yourself another demon, and they have no interest in saving her life. They speak to Troll as if he is a child who wants his favorite toy fixed. He's a spoiled child who wants his favorite toy fixed. And, and they're like, look, you can just get another toy. What's your problem? And this is how most characters in the Malazan world see them. Uh, and this then culminates in one of the best scenes uh, in the series uh, where the demon tricks uh, Trull to escape and Trull's mother's like, oh, look, I told you, they're these uh, inhuman deceptive creatures. They'll never change. And 
Trull doesn't take it as a defeat at all. He's just happy that Lilac has escaped and hopes that she finds her family. He doesn't want her to be a slave and a tool anymore. Other than slavery, there are parallels to colonialism as well, which I really enjoyed sort of dissecting. Look at the way in which Rulard and the Cripple God, obviously by extension, use this classic divide and conquer trick. There are two demonic civilizations that are at war in Adel Gamelin, and Rula diverts the water from the nascent to destroy one army and thus get the other one indebted to him. This has been a ploy used by colonial powers throughout history, this divide and conquer strategy. If we were to throw out just a recent example, the British conquest of India was consolidated almost completely use, using this trick, where individual kings were pitted against each other and the British would help one side win and the victor would then be indebted to them. Once Rulard gets them on his side by using this divide and conquer strategy, he then uses them simply as foot soldiers and arrow fodder, much like how colonial armies use soldiers who belong to the subjugated races. Not to bang on with the Indian analogy, but once again, a recent example would be the way in which the British Empire conquered much of Africa and East Asia using sepoys, soldiers from South Asia, Indians, Nepalis, modern-day Pakistanis, modern-day Bangladeshis. These were the guys who served and died as the foot soldiers for almost a century. It was these guys who were destroyed for British control around the world to spread. And here again, I have a quote from Midnight Tides because it has a lot of great content about this. Here's what Trull observes to himself when he sees so many demons serving in the Edur army. The creatures were bound, now doomed to fight a war not of their making, where the only release was annihilation. This line can be copy-pasted to describe the lives of all those Indian sepoys and Nepalese Gurkhas who were made to fight wars that were never theirs at the behest of the empires that ruled them and whose deaths meant nothing more than a casualty list for the British Empire. And, and things like this is what I mean by Ericsson just placing strands here and there. He never shoves this down our throats. It's just a strand. It's just one line here and there. But there's still so much depth to it. And this brings me to some of the larger aspects of racism that can be explored using the portrayal of demons in the series. The term demon itself is a racially ignorant term in the Malazan universe that everybody from the most highly educated to the illiterate use. As Odin has noted in the quote I read, a demon is simply an otherworldly entity. That's it. Even though technically they are meant to be the denizens of Adel Gamelin or the Shadow Warren or whatever, we see everything from Quick Ben to Kasa to the Hounds of Darkness to Soul Taken shapeshifters described as demons by the characters in this world. It's very similar to how racial slurs are used to describe a large number of people who are actually from very different societies, but in the eyes of the racist, they're all Pakis or Blacks or Chinkies or whatever, even though the people falling into these distinctions would often be pretty diverse. This sort of thing happens, by the way, even when people don't consciously try to be racist. In fact, just look at how there's so much chess beating about hate crimes against Asians at the moment and the framing of Asians as some kind of united ethnic or racial identity. And I see this term being used even by educated progressives who should know better. In fact, especially by educated progressives who should know better, who don't consider themselves to be racist. But to use the term Asian in the context of race or ethnicity is so deeply ignorant when you think about it. An Arab is as different from a Korean as a European is. In fact, there is a lot more similarity between the Arabs and Europeans than either of them and the Koreans. But the Arabs and the Koreans are lumped into this one group called Asians. I am as different racially, culturally, ethnically, historically, politically from a guy in Japan as any European is. But the Japanese guy and I are both Asians. A Turkish guy and a Filipino guy are both Asians. 
this is sort of how the word demon is used in the Malazan books. It's, it's a geographic term which people mistakenly believe to be a racial or biological term. And ironically, who is the only other person to see through this conceit? We saw Udinas, who's the other one? Is it some god? Is it some paragon of empathy and compassion? Is it some tragic noble figure? Nope. It's Kasa Olong. This is what Kasa tells this, uh, the spirit of his companion, Delum Thod, when he's pursued by that terrifying wolf devas in, uh, in House of Chains. Right? So uh, Delum Thod says there's a demon chasing us. And Kasa says, not a demon, Delum Thod. We Tebla are too careless with that word. Fokrul Asail, soul taken, devas, none are demons in truth. For none were summoned to this world, none belong to any other realm but this one. They are in truth no different from us Tebla or the lowlanders, no different from the Rizan and Cape Moths, from horses and dogs. They are all of this world, Delum thought. So he's the only one who says, stop being so racist, dude. That's a devas. That's not a demon. Demons are creatures that are summoned into this world. Do not be so careless with your words. In that moment, Kasa demonstrates far more awareness of the weaponization of words and stereotypes than even gods like Shadow Throne and Osirk, who should know better. Right, because uh, these guys use the term demon repeatedly. So a slave, Odinas, and the breaker of chains, the anti-slavery character in the series, Kasa Olong, are the only two who see this illusion for what it is, which I thought was interesting. Another superb narrative technique Erickson uses is deliberately leaving them out whenever the other races and histories are mentioned. Think about it. Look at all the talk we get from historians and the educated in these books. They talk about the Kachin Chamal, the Fokrul Asail, the Jagud, the Tilanaimas, the Toblakai, the humans, the Teast races. Nobody ever speaks about the demons and gives them due credit for having mighty empires and kingdoms and histories. In fact, if Malas Tube if Malas tube was translated, like transplanted rather, into the actual Malazan world, the Ruthenbad equivalent would for sure, for sure, be some demon that was like, uh, but what about the Aral Gamelan perspective? What about the demonic perspective, right? Because the characters in the books never give them that credit. And their perspective and their history and all that, surely they have a lot to add. But that's never really counted as a part of what we see as this structure. Ericsson does give them a lot of credit because Ericsson often shows us that they do have these massive kingdoms with uh, kings and princes and foot soldiers and peasants. But the denizens of this world in the books simply do not because to them the demons are outsiders. They are like these horrors. They are from some nightmarish world and they are all beasts as far as most people are concerned. At the same time, this doesn't mean that Erickson portrays all demons as innocent and childlike either. As we've seen in previous videos, Erickson doesn't do black and white stuff like that, right? The demons are frightening and there is a certain monstrousness to them. We see many demons who do behave like stereotypical demons as well. Erickson doesn't romanticize them as nothing but noble victims. Most of them will pick you up and eat you alive if you run into them. Right. So lastly, I just wanted to mention some of my favorite demons in the series. I've already mentioned Pearl and Lilac. Apt is another superb example. There's a small line with uh, Shadow Throne in one of the books where he says she used to be the mistress of a powerful demon lord and then fell out of favor because of her politicking, which once again is such a small reference, but it suggests that demons have these structured societies with political intrigue and machinations and things like that. Uh, Ishka Jarak has an excellent video on, uh, on APT, uh, by the way. You guys should check it out. On the topic of APT itself, Panic, the child with APT, sometimes highlights this even further for me because uh, there's a famous Rudyard Kipling novel called Kim, right, which is about a white Irish boy raised by Indians and he's a bit of a feral child because of it. 
if we were to use the whole demon for oppressed race analogy panic is kind of representative of a recurring trope now that i think about it in western fiction which is this whole idea of a white child who is raised by natives other than kim uh, from uh, uh, the Rudyard Kipling uh, novel that I just mentioned. Another example off the top of my head would be Kevin Costner's love interest in uh, Dances with Wolves, right? A white girl who's uh, raised by uh, uh, Native Americans. So I always found Panic interesting from that angle as well. One of the most memorable demons in the entire series, if not the most memorable one, is Grey Frog. I will probably do a separate video on Greyfrog somewhere down the line because there's so much gold there. He's a magical character and a big part of what humanizes these things called demons in our sort of minds. Uh, I'll do a separate video on him at some point. Uh, who else? The owner of Smiley's Bar turns out to be a demon and that's hilarious. Uh, there's a there's a funny scene where one of the prostitutes who frequents that bar is like, ah, you know what, uh, once you get to know him, he's not that bad. I thought, he, I thought that was funny. Uh, I have to mention the demon princess, right? Uh, the twins, uh, the guys who are with Rulard and fight away the folk ruler sale and then they throw the folk ruler sale down a hole and they piss into it and they're farmers in a reaper's gale or whatever. That is so funny and they get blown up. They are some of the best examples of really minor, nameless characters making an impact on me as a reader. They are so funny. And even there, even there, Erickson so cleverly, expertly shows us the hierarchical and complex nature of demon societies. Because these guys don't speak like uh, Lilac. She's just a commoner, right? She's just a netcaster, a fisherman. These guys are princes. And even the words they use, the way they are portrayed is as being far more charismatic and relaxed and competent than her. It's those little touches that make revisiting these stories so much fun. Uh, who else? Uh, oh yeah, the, the, the demon lord that I'm obsessed with at the end of Gardens of the Moon. Uh, many people have asked me why I'm so curious about this character. I don't have a rational answer. I just am. I mean, we see this demon lord, uh, once again suggesting a sort of a structured hierarchy. Powerful enough to take on Anamanda Rake. Even Anamanda Rake says this will be close because he's not too sure who wins. And then we never see this demon lord again. We never see this demon lord in Dragnipur either. So what was the deal with that, right? I need to know. I've always needed to know. So those are some of my favorite demon appearances in the series, guys. Uh, technically, I guess my favorite demon appearance is the uh, the Sirinth demon, which uh, Quick Ben has to free outside Baukalane's mansion. But uh, I'm talking about actual characters here that can, that can converse, right? So to conclude things, what I really want to emphasize here is the subtlety of the commentary. All of these are just strands, as I was saying earlier. It's never forced into us. Uh, it's never bludgeoned, honestly. Anybody can do anti-racist commentary if it's just bludgeoning the reader with it, right? That requires no authenticity. Anybody can do it. Even shallow virtue signaling hacks can do that. But only a true, actual anti-racist will be able to sort of uh, be subtle about it, will have the knowledge and experience to be subtle about handling it. Almost all the points I mentioned earlier are just throwaway lines here and there. And yet by the end, a far more complex picture emerges. He never explicitly tells us any of this. He just leaves it there to be mined by the people who get it. And this point of subtlety has always been my personal litmus test for whether someone is truly anti-racist or not. If they're constantly waving the anti-racist flag and constantly beating the anti-racist war drums, they're usually well-intentioned but unfortunately ignorant. The real anti-racists are the ones who are subtle about it because they understand the complexity of the entire picture. And that's once again the allure of Ericsson that we keep seeing on this channel. This ability to make his world resonate even with someone who comes from a completely different civilization and culture. So there you have it, guys. That's my take on how the portrayal of demons is used as a subtle but at the same time powerful tool for anti-racist uh, commentary. Thank you for joining me. I hope we get Ericsson's uh, 
thoughts on this because I think it's a very important and timely topic and that his insight will mean a lot to many of us who've experienced those things, but obviously it's up to him, right? Uh, I'll probably regret saying this, but I just feel the impulsive need to point out that uh, booktube punditry and booktube drama is often a uniquely Western cultural phenomenon and that it would be a shame if cross-cultural discourse is now frozen because of it. As you guys know, I never ask people to smash the like button and uh, uh, click on the bell icon and uh, subscribe to my channel or whatever because that was never the intention. This was always meant to be a cross-cultural conversation between a Malazan scholar and a Malazan creator from two different parts of the world that highlight the universality of these books to you, my precious subscribers. And it would be a shame if cultural concerns arising out of this one small dot on the world map now determines whether this interaction continues or not. I mean, it's, it's one thing if it stops because my videos suck, that would be fine. But it seems quite tragic to me and it feels like a, a repudiation of the entire point of my channel. Uh, what's the point in bringing a non-Western perspective to the Malazan discourse if a bunch of Americans or Canadians or whatever can uh, shut down the conversation from inside their little narrow cultural bubble. Anyway, I probably you know said too much already. Uh, it's completely up to him, guys. Uh, as I was saying, uh, if what I said was disrespectful or out of line, I apologize. Uh, so yeah, that's it, guys. Will I be the Anamanda Rake yearning for Mother Dark's return or will Erickson join me in my fight against uh, racism, global racism, by uh, continuing to interact uh, uh, with this channel? The answer, as Boat Finder from the Anibar tribe would say, can only be found in the unfound time, right? So there we go, guys. Uh, demons and anti-racism. I hope you like that. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.